the spade bit into earth, somewhere on the Mittelberg, a wooded hill in central Germany. It was July 1999. Two men were digging fast, illegally, following the shriek of their metal detector. When the blade struck metal, they didn't stop. They pried harder. What came up was a bronze disc, roughly the size of a dinner plate, caked in 3,000 years of dirt. Heavy, corroded green, and across its face, even through the grime, they could see it. A scatter of gold symbols embedded in the metal. A crescent, a circle, stars. They damaged it, pulling it free. The spade gouged the rim. They didn't care. They shoved it into a bag, along with two bronze swords, axes, a chisel, and twisted fragments of arm spirals, and they disappeared into the black market. For three years, the disc moved through the hands of dealers and collectors, passed along in back rooms and hotel basements. No one knew what it was. No one knew what it meant. It wasn't until 2002, in a sting operation in Switzerland, that police finally recovered it and placed it into the hands of archaeologists. When they cleaned the surface, what emerged stopped them cold. Against a blue-green patina of ancient bronze, 32 small gold circles were scattered like seeds across the sky. A large round disc of gold sat near the edge. A crescent, horns upturned, gleamed nearby. And along the rim, two long arcs of gold swept across the horizon like the rails of some celestial machine. It looked impossibly deliberate. It looked modern. It looked, in the words of one scholar, like it was winking at them. The immediate reaction was suspicion. This had to be a hoax. Nothing like this had ever been found in Bronze Age Europe. The iconography was too clean, too recognisable. It looked like something a forger might imagine ancient people would make. A child's drawing of the night sky, rendered in precious metal. But metal doesn't lie. The bronze itself was tested. It contained no detectable lead-210, a radioactive isotope that decays over centuries. This metal had been underground for a very long time. The swords buried with the disc were of a specific type, datable to around 1600 BC. A fragment of birch bark still clinging to one hilt gave a radiocarbon date, 16th to 15th century BC. Isotopic analysis went further. The copper in the bronze came from the Austrian Alps. The tin came from Cornwall, at the far edge of Bronze Age Europe. The gold, tested in two separate phases, came first from the Carnan River in Cornwall, then later, in repairs, from the Carpathian Mountains in what is now Romania. This wasn't a modern fake. It was a Bronze Age object that had travelled across a continent before it was ever buried. The looters had destroyed the archaeological context, but soil samples taken from the site matched residue on the artefacts. The hoard, disc, swords, axes, spirals, had been placed together in a single pit on the summit of the Mittelberg and left there for over three and a half thousand years. By 2020, a few contrarian voices suggested the disc might be from the Iron Age, a thousand years younger. But the metallurgy, the typology of the weapons, the corrosion patterns and the isotopic fingerprints all pointed the same direction. The Nebra Sky disc was made, modified and buried during the early Bronze Age, somewhere around 1600 BC by people of the Unitisha culture. So the question shifted. Not whether it was real, but what it was for. Look closely at the surface. The disc is not a snapshot. It's a palimpsest, a manuscript written over, erased, amended, across generations. In its earliest form, the disc was simpler. Gold stars scattered across the bronze. A large round plate, the sun or the full moon. A crescent moon. Most of the stars are placed almost randomly, arranged for visual balance rather than astronomical precision. But there is one cluster that breaks the pattern. 
seven small circles grouped tightly together near the center. This is the Pleiades. The seven sisters are not just a pretty asterism. For thousands of years, across cultures from Polynesia to the Mediterranean, the Pleiades have been a seasonal clock. In ancient Greece, their rising marked the start of the sailing season. Their setting signaled the harvest. Farmers in Central Europe used them into the 19th century to time planting and reaping. But there is something more sophisticated encoded here. Something that connects this Bronze Age hilltop in Germany to the scribes of Babylon. A cuneiform text known as the Mul Apin, compiled in Mesopotamia around the same period, lays out an astronomical rule. If a crescent moon appears near the Pleiades within the first few days of spring, it is time to add a leap month to the calendar. This is not poetry, it's mathematics. Lunar calendars are unstable. 12 lunar months add up to roughly 354 days. 11 days short of a solar year. If you do nothing, your calendar drifts. Your spring festivals slide into summer. Your harvest rituals into winter. To keep the calendar aligned with the seasons, you need to add a 13th month every few years. The question is, when? The Babylonians solved this with careful observation. The Pleiades, the crescent moon, and the timing of the month became a trigger. It's possible, even likely, that this knowledge travelled along the same trade routes that brought Cornish tin and Alpine copper into Central Europe. Bronze Age Europe was not isolated. It was networked, and the Nebra disc, in its first phase, may have been a physical mnemonic for exactly this rule. When the sky looks like this, crescent near the Pleiades, stop the clock, add the month, keep sacred time in step with the harvest. This means the disc wasn't just art, it was a tool, and the people who owned it weren't just warriors or traders, they were the keepers of time. But time, for the disc, did not stand still. Sometime after its creation, perhaps a generation later, the disc went back into the workshop. Two long arcs of gold were added to the rim, one on each side, sweeping across the edge like parentheses. To make room, two of the original stars were covered. A third was moved. The craftsman didn't care about preserving the original design. The function had changed. These arcs are not decorative. They span an angle of roughly 82 degrees. If you stand on the Mittelberg Hill and watch the sun over the course of a year, you'll notice it doesn't rise in the same place every morning. In midwinter, it rises in the southeast. In midsummer, far to the northeast. The angle between these two extremes, the width of the sun's seasonal swing along the horizon, is 82 degrees at this latitude. The arcs on the disc match this exactly. The disc had been transformed. It was no longer just a lunar calendar tied to the stars. It was now a solar instrument aligned to the horizons, tracking the sun's journey from solstice to solstice. This obsession with the solstices wasn't unique. Across Bronze Age Europe, people were building monuments to mark these turning points. At Stonehenge in England, the axis aligns with the midwinter sunset. At the Gossek Circle in Germany, built 3,000 years before the disc, timber gates frame the winter solstice sunrise and sunset. The angle between those gates, 82 degrees, the same as the arcs on the disc. The people who modified the Nebra disc were participating in a tradition thousands of years old. They were encoding the geometry of the sky into portable gold, making the horizon itself something you could hold in your hands. This suggests a shift in worldview. The stellar calendar of the Pleiades was being supplemented, or perhaps eclipsed, by a new focus on the sun. The sun was becoming central, the dominant celestial power. And then, the disk changed again. In its third phase, a new element was added. At the bottom of the disk, 
Between the two horizon arcs, the craftsman attached a curved strip of gold. It's different from the others, made of gold from a different source, the Carpathians rather than Cornwall, and it's decorated with short parallel lines incised like ribs or oars. This is not a star. This is not a horizon. This is a boat. The Unatisha people lived far from any ocean. Central Germany is landlocked. Rivers, yes, canoes, dugouts, but nothing that resembles the vessels carved into Scandinavian rock art from this period. Yet that's exactly what this resembles. The boats etched onto stone in Sweden and Norway. It also links to the famous Trundholm Sun chariot found in Denmark. There, a bronze horse pulls a gold disc, symbolizing the sun's journey across the sky by day. But the Nibra disc reveals the other half of that story. In the mythology of Northern Europe, the sun was a restless traveler. By day, it rode in a chariot. But at night, when it sank below the western horizon, it didn't just vanish. It needed a vessel to cross the dark waters of the underworld back to the east. It needed a boat. And here, on a disc found hundreds of miles from the sea, is that missing vessel. The sun needed a boat to make the journey back. It sailed through dark waters, through the underworld, to rise again in the morning. The addition of this boat to the Nibra disc marks a fundamental shift. We've moved from practical astronomy, the leap month rule, to geometric observation, the solstice arcs, and now, finally, into myth. The disc was no longer just a calculator for farmers or a ceremonial prop for priests. It had become a cosmological icon, a map not just of the sky, but of the universe itself. This connection to Scandinavian belief systems is vital. It tells us that ideas were traveling as far as the metals. The people of the Mittelberg shared a worldview with the people hundreds of kilometers to the north. They believed the cosmos was cyclical, that the sun was fragile, that it required help, horses, boats, human ritual to complete its journey. And this belief was important enough to inscribe in gold. The disc itself is a technical marvel. Modern analysis shows that the bronze plate began as a cast preform, then was hammered and heated repeatedly, forged and annealed in cycles to make it strong and workable. The metal grains reveal at least 10 cycles of this brutal process. Each heating, each hammering, each cooling brought the disc closer to its final form. The gold inlays were not soldered. The craftsmen cut grooves into the bronze with chisels and hammered thin sheets of gold into the recesses, locking them in place through sheer pressure. One mistake, one crack in the bronze, and the entire piece would be ruined. Yet despite its value, despite the labor and the rarity of its materials, the disc was destined for the ground. In its final phase, the disc was perforated. Holes were punched around the rim, slicing through one of the beautiful horizon arcs. It seems the disc was meant to be mounted, perhaps nailed to a wooden pole, a ceremonial standard carried in processions. Imagine it catching the light, a chieftain or priest holding it aloft, the gold flashing in the sun, a declaration, I hold the sky. I know when winter ends, I know the path of the sun through the underworld. But around 1600 BC, something happened. The disc, along with the swords and axes and spirals, was taken to the summit of the Mittelberg and buried. Before it was placed in the earth, one of the horizon arcs was torn off. Deliberately. The disc was damaged, perhaps decommissioned. This wasn't a cache meant to be retrieved. It was a votive offering, a sacrifice. But why bury the sky? The Unatice culture, at its height, was not a small or simple society. These were people who lived in fortified settlements, 
who controlled trade routes stretching from the Atlantic to the Carpathians, who buried their elites in earthen mounds 15 meters high, packed with bronze weapons and gold ornaments. One burial mound at Bornhuk contained over 500 grindstones, evidence of centralized grain processing on an industrial scale. Archaeologists interpret this as a sign of tribute, taxation, redistribution, the feeding of a non-producing class, soldiers, administrators, priests. The Unitice weren't just farmers. They were organized, stratified, possibly even on the edge of statehood. And the knowledge encoded in the disk, how to track the moon, how to read the solstices, how to time the harvest, was power. Control over the calendar meant control over labor, over ritual, over the entire rhythm of society. But by 1600 BC, the Unatitia culture was collapsing. We don't know why. Climate shifts, resource depletion, social upheaval, any or all of these could have played a role. Perhaps the old knowledge was failing. Perhaps the calendar no longer worked. Perhaps the priests who once commanded the sky were losing their authority. Or perhaps the disc had become too powerful, too dangerous, too sacred to remain in human hands. The burial of the Nebra disc may represent the death of a worldview. The precise astronomical knowledge it contained, the Pleiades rule, the solstice geometry, faded into symbol, into myth, into something remembered but no longer understood. We see echoes of this knowledge elsewhere, in the so-called golden hats, tall conical headdresses hammered from paper-thin gold, covered in thousands of embossed symbols. These hats, found in Germany and France and dating from the centuries after the disc, encode lunar and solar cycles, specifically the 19-year Metonic cycle, the period after which the moon's phases repeat on the same calendar dates. Like the disc, they suggest that the people we used to call barbarians were, in fact, astronomer priests obsessed with the mathematics of time. But the Nebra sky disc remains unique. It is the oldest known concrete depiction of the cosmos, older than Egyptian star maps. It's older by a few centuries than the astronomical ceiling of Senenmut's tomb in Thebes. The Nebra sky disk is older than anything comparable in the ancient world. It is a window into a mind that looked at the chaotic scatter of stars and saw order, saw pattern, saw meaning. When the disk was finally recovered in 2002 and brought to the State Museum of Prehistory in Halle, it was placed in a dark room lit only by fiber optics that mimic starlight. It rests there now, silent, a winking golden eye from the deep past. The looters who pulled it from the earth saw only metal to be sold. But the people who made it, who modified it, who carried it in processions and finally buried it on a hilltop, saw the universe. They saw the Pleiades signaling the harvest. They saw the sun swinging between its solstice gates. They saw a boat sailing through the dark waters of the underworld, carrying the light back to the living world. The Nebra sky disk is proof that we have always been astronomers, that long before telescopes, before writing, before cities, we were already looking up, already trying to read the sky, already trying to hold time in our hands. The disc is safe now. Its journey through the underworld is complete. It asks us to remember that our ancestors were not looking at their feet. They were looking at the stars. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider pressing like and subscribing to the channel. It's the best way to support more videos like this. And if you're ready for another Bronze Age mystery, I recommend my video, The Ancient Treasure That Shouldn't Exist. Thank you.